Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Mic check. Okay, we're good. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for welcoming us today. Thank you uh, to these three esteemed guests who will have a lot more to say than I will uh, on this topic that's uh, emerging as a focal point of discussion uh, in the discourse. Uh, I am Paul Taillon. I'm a partner at Mass Strategy. I have uh, over a decade of political experience uh, working on campaigns, uh, both in government and in the private sector, and uh, now work with uh, a lovely team of folks uh, doing high-impact marketing and digital communications uh, for folks across the country. Uh, I'm pleased to have with us today, uh, like I said, a panel of uh, very well-spoken guests. Uh, first of all, Dr. Michael Geist. Uh, at the end, he's a law professor at the University of Ottawa, holds a Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law, and is a member of the Center for Law, Technology, and uh, sorry, member member of the Center for Law, Technology, and Society. He has a Bachelor of Laws degree from Osgood Law in Toronto, Master of Laws degrees from Cambridge in the UK, and Columbia Law School in New York, and a Doctorate of Law from Columbia Law School. Dr. Geist serves on many, law, uh, many boards, including the Internet Archive Canada and the EFF Advisory Board. He was appointed to the Order of Ontario in 2018 and has received numerous awards for his work, including the Canadian Journalist for Freedom of Expression Vox Libera Award in 2018, the Kruger Award for Policy Leadership and the Public Knowledge IP3 Award in 2010, the Les Fowley Award for Intellectual Freedom from the Ontario Library Association in 2009, and the EFF's Pioneer Award in 2008, and Canary's Iway Public Leadership Award for his contribution to the development of the internet in Canada. Uh, you can uh, read more about him at, uh, at his website. Your mom your file. Sorry. <laughs> David Freiheitz uh, is our next guest here, uh, right to my left. Uh, David is uh, known online as Viva Fry. He's a former Montreal litigator turned Florida rumbler. He began his law practice at one of Canada's largest law firms. Uh, after, birth of, after the birth of his first daughter, he began his solo practice, which he turned into a successful and reputable boutique uh, litigation firm. He then discovered his true calling in life, trying to make sense of the world in which we live. He has developed such a stellar reputation in the world of legal and political commentary that even Google Gemini has difficult saying, difficulty saying anything bad about him. <laughs> For now. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Jen Gerson uh, is a noted problem in and for the Canadian media. She co-founded The Line, the country's last best hope for irreverent commentary. She has further testified in both the Senate and House, House about what a bad idea C-18 was. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit today. Her writing has appeared pretty much everywhere by her own contrivance. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, just want to get started with where we are in the lay of the land today. Uh, in our front view today, we have C63, the government's online harms bill. It's obviously kind of the biggest piece of discourse right now. I think uh, the experience and approach of this government and how they've handled some of the previous online regulation bills maybe speak to how they've approached this one as well and what they've kind of tried to do with uh, the social media and online realms and how they tried to approach this with, uh, with their regulations. The first bill, C11, surrounding content regulation or online streaming services, C18, the funding of government designated media by big tech, the link tax, uh, as some would call it, and uh, now the latest entrant, uh, C63, the online harms bill. So with each of these, and at different times, so I think it's fair to say none of this has gone super smoothly for the government. It's a, it's a lot of, uh, they've raised a lot of chaos. Can you uh, maybe speak to their approach here, Jen, and the instruments that they've used, the people they've listened to, and what they're really guided by as they kind of go through this? Sure. So um, I would say just from a bird's eye view, what I think I've observed this government and its approach to the internet is a, a high degree of what I think are um, painful good intentions and naivete around trying to uh, identify and regulate and fix problems that they don't uh, necessarily fully understand, like they don't necessarily fully understand the space or the types of industries that they're trying to resolve. Um, listening to, I think as a lot of governments in their, in their late stages do, tend to, tending to listen to a fairly narrow group of people who have the influence and access to lobby them and gain access to them and then um, coming up with solutions that are presented as uh, fait accomplis, and then demonizing a lot of the people who point out the obvious problems with some of the legislation and approaches that they're, that they're engaging in. Um, and I think we saw that pretty consistently across C11, C18, and, and C63. Um, there's no return to first principles to ask, okay, well, there's a problem here. Is this a problem we can or should resolve First is your first should be the first question, and then building a solution, if any, from that position of first principles. Instead, it's more like there's a problem. Let's turn to these people who are in our social and, and lobbying networks to figure out a solution, 
um, coming up with a solution and then uh, when people like Mr. Dr. Geister or myself or anybody else says, yeah, this is, this is obviously not going to work for this or this reason, the response is, well, you're a partisan flack who's in the pocket of big tech and therefore everything you say is invalid or, or bad faith or a disinformation effort that's out to get us. Um, and then, of course, the inevitable consequences of their, of their uh, legislation happens. For example, uh, meta-pulling news from their, from their platforms. Um, and then there's, well, how dare you, <laughs> you know, right? So uh, there, it's, it's this weird um, uh, self-perpetuating cycle of, of, of failure to ad adopt legislations or approaches um, from, a, from a solid philosophical grounding, and then the problems, I think, compound from there for them. Mm. So uh, partisan flack, David Geis, do you want to give us your take on uh, how, the, how, how this has gone from your perspective, being an outside commentator? Well, I certainly have faced some of that backlash, for sure. Um, I, I would agree with almost everything Jen says. I think the jury is still out on C63. Mm -hmm. uh, so I certainly think it's the case that both C11, the streaming bill, and then the news bill C18, I, I think that was a really perfect description. I mean, they, they, identif it, not only, they identified what I think can reasonably be described as a concern. And I think it's very much true that uh, there are certain people that, or certain stakeholders that had the ear of the government um, and they just kept pushing, even in the face of, of considerable opposition, and I think considered opposition. I think, I think the criticism uh, attempted by many to be constructive on those bills, and in some ways it, it, it's, it's a bit odd, just because they just were own goals. In the case of C11 and the concerns around regulating user content, uh, at the end of the day, they put forward a policy direction to the CRTC that actually scaled back, the addressed the concerns, but there was really no need for that in the first place. And in the case of C18, as I think everyone uh, will recognize, they tried to salvage the deal with a deal with Google, to salvage the legislation with a deal with Google, but the harm was already done and has continued to be done. In the case of C63, though, uh, and we can certainly get into a debate on the merits of the legislation, I think they, they have endeavored to take a slightly different approach. They actually did have uh, a planned bill that was supposed to have been, been introduced back in 2021. They did a consultation on it. It was actually during the election campaign in 2021. It was roundly criticized by groups from across the spectrum, even the groups that had their ear and that they thought would be happy with it. Uh, and so there, in that instance, they legitimately did go back to the drawing board. They had an expert panel. They did more consultations. And I do feel that the large chunk of, the, of this bill, the part that deals with internet regulation, is actually pretty reflective of that consultation, and I think it's something that, we can work, that people can work with in a way that uh, C11 and C18 ran into some, some difficulties. The problem with the bill is that they have included, in addition to that, it's really at least two bills in one. There are changes to the criminal code and changes to the Human Rights Act, and both of those aren't as reflective of the, the, that consultation, and I think that's where they've really run into some trouble. Yeah. Trouble? David? Well, I was going to say, if the only thing the government did was to identify problems, that would already be a better start than what we're at right now. I think they manufacture fabricated problems so they can then propose solutions to problems that don't exist and only empower themselves even more. C11, C18, C63. And like it's, 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 it's wild because C11, which was Online Streaming Act, what was the problem? I mean, the problem was from the government's perspective, there was free speech on the internet and they weren't making money off of it and they weren't suppressing it or silencing it for what they considered to be disfavored political speech. So they manufacture a problem and then if you come out and say this is unnecessary, well then you're anti-Canadian, you're anti-Canadian content. Um, C18, the link tax, uh, I don't believe there was any problem there except to find another way to indirectly subsidize failing, flailing Canadian legacy media. And the, 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 the solution that Google has, I don't know what is it, it's, it's um, how much, 100 million a year now that's going to be going to accredited media, journalists or organizations that employ enough journalists beyond a certain threshold, the government's going to decide. So it's just one way of controlling independent voices, and the internet is the last wild west where people like me can say things that will sooner than later be deemed to be hate speech. You, right. Stick with you for a second. Good point. We'll stick with you for a second. On, on the first entry into the big foray entry into the online regulation that they did with C11 on kind of the content side, do you think it's really set the stage uh, or, or poisoned the well, so to speak, kind of for future iterations or entries into, into, this, into this regulatory world? Do you think they, have you seen any kind of big changes in the landscape, the way people have reacted to that, that really kind of set the skeptical 
you know, world uh, ablaze with anything they would try to do uh, with regards to C18 or even C63. I, th- I think uh, the, the well was probably poisoned well before that. I mean, that nobody's trusted uh, Trudeau for a little, a little bit of time. The problem is it sort of might have poisoned the well with respect to the conservatives who petition or campaign off revoking a law that hadn't been enacted yet as opposed to just opposing it staunchly before it gets enacted. But the, this is, who, who was it? It's one of the Greek philosophers. More laws, less justice. This is just another way for the government to control speech in an area where it didn't control it and continue to benefit its, I'll call them corrupt, but rather the legacy media that is failing on its own merits and they need legislation, prohibitions, and indirect funding in order to survive. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Michael, over to you for uh, talking a little bit more about C63 and where the government started and where they are now. Uh, I know that they've positioned this as very much trying to protect kids online and, mm-hmm. and deal with kind of the, uh, the ramifications of, of, of that. Is there anything that you might want to kind of explore a little bit deeper in terms of where they started? Uh, any kind of Trojan horses potentially in that bill that people have discovered, whether it's related to reincarnations of Section 13 uh, from the Human Rights Code uh, online or severe penalties for people uh, posting things online that others don't like. Sure. I, I, let me, I actually want to start with the online harms part of it, uh, and we can get into some of the other issues. Uh, and that's because, candidly, there are problems. Uh, I'm finding myself defending government legislation is an odd place to be right now. But, but I have to say, uh, anyone who's paid any attention to the hate online realizes that there are problems. Uh, their revenge porn is a real issue. Bullying of our children is a real issue. Uh, inciting terror is a real issue. Uh, and we don't have platforms uh, that have necessarily responded and taken the level of responsibility that I think we would have wanted, or at a minimum, the responses they take are opaque. There is a lack of transparency and a lack of accountability in terms of how those things get addressed. And what this legislation at its heart seeks to do is identify those kinds of harms and say that if you are a platform, you are going to have responsibilities in terms of allowing people to flag content that that creates that kind of harm, allowing users to block other users that may target them, um, as well as come up with a plan that includes far more transparency. Frankly, that strikes me as a good thing. Uh, I think the devil is in the details around how it gets enforced because uh, this needs to get enforced. The government can't enforce it. We don't want the CRTC to enforce it. So they've called for the creation of a new digital safety commission that would be in charge of doing that. Uh, I think there are legitimate concerns about how that would unfold. Uh, And so I think that, and that is, it should be noted, the bulk of what is Bill C63 um, is, I think, entirely defensible and, in fact, Uh, adopts a position that is reflective of much of what they heard from community groups from across the country. It is not, I don't think, reflective of a single stakeholder. Sounds a lot like a just trust us kind of approach. Well, I mean, so, and I would say the collapse of the mainstream media is a legitimate problem. Um, The lack of access to good quality journalistic information that is going to result as as a result of that financial collapse, and the financial collapse is completely of their own doing, that is, that does present a democratic deficit issue. Um, Is the solution to that problem to create a private media sector that is completely and wholly dependent either directly or indirectly in subsidies and handouts? No. (laughs) This is why C18 was a flawed at first principles kind of position. However, I do think that there are roles for the government to play in helping to, to some extent, address some of those issues. I would say the role that the CBC plays is, 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 is one that where a federal government is, would be appropriately inserting itself into that, into that particular issue. I would say, for example, we have an oligopic telecommunications industry that is making tens of billions of dollars of profit um, because it has privileged access to public goods like broadcast spectrum, and they ha- yet you have the same oligopic companies making ten- tens of billions of profit laying off, uh, sorry, and part of why they have access to that privileged spectrum is because in exchange for that privileged spectrum, they perform a public service that is literally built into their broadcast licenses. One of the public services they provide is supposedly supposed to be journalistic, and yet we have the same companies that are making tens of billions of dollars mm-hmm. using oligarch- oligopic access to Canadian to Canadian consumers, um, then laying off thousands of journalists, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, being in breach of their license agreements um, at the same time, right? I think that, that to me is a place where it would be appropriate for a federal government to intervene in this problem. However, that would require a government that could look at that problem from a first principles perspective and 
and, and recognize where it is appropriate to intervene and also, more importantly, where it's not appropriate for them inter to intervene and where it's not appropriate for them to intervene is propping up the, the private sector media. Well, if I ask an obvious question, why would the collapse of the MSM be a problem and not a solution? Because, well... well <laughs> Because, because if they can't, the reason why they're going to collapse is not because people are sabotaging them. It's because they're sabotaging themselves because they are no longer independent media. They are government lackeys and they this, work for this, the government. And this, and this is why funding them is a problem. No, I so I say the, the, colla the collapse is the solution. Yeah. Let them survive on their own merits, like the rebel news, I, like the true news out there. I, I completely, as an independent media who is making some, some re making a wage, I agree with you. These companies need to be able to survive or die on their own business merits. I complete and and propping propping up essentially what are zombie corporations, which is what a lot of the a lot of the media is, is not the correct path forward. You do have to allow, allow allow failing companies to die in order to have an innovative media market, and this is not the solution. However, I do think that uh, this is also one of my pitches for the CBC here is that <laughs> essentially, you know, you, you, do you really want to try and govern a, a country? where your only access to information is either highly partisan, highly skewed, isn't rooted in some kind of grounded journalistic effort, I think that you are going to find yourself trying to govern a, a, a country where people's understanding of the world around them is mediated by their local conspiracy theory Facebook groups. I think that's going to be a problem for you in the near future. In the near well, future. And, and, and I think leaving it to the open market, people will listen to what they want to listen to, what Absolutely. is good news and reliable will survive. The, I agree. the bad conspiracy theorists get outed. It's not, it's like, and, and I'm not using the word conspiracy theorists loosely, but the bad ones get outed. The discreditable ones get discredited, and that's then people fine. stop listening to that's them. That's fine. But as I said, this is why I think there is an appropriate role for the federal government to I mean, the federal government already plays an outsized role in the, in the fact that it subsidizes the CBC. The CBC, I think, can't survive in its current incarnation. I agree with that. I think the CBC has to be radically reimagined. Um, but there is a role, especially when we're talking about rural news, highly local news, areas where the private sector can't, simply has no interest in competing or providing good quality access information in parts of this country. There's a role for the CBC to play in that. I think there's a role for, the, for, for um, uh, uh, oligarchic organizations like Bell to be investing in things like uh, W5, investigative journalism, and I think that that should be a part of the public good that they provide in, access, in, 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 comp sorry, in, in part of creating that access to their, to their, to their spectrum license. W, W5 is the one that ran a small hit piece on me to run a bigger hit piece on well, Rumble, I'm but sorry, I'm not that you, I have no, anything no, against and, them. And, no, no, you're, and, and, you're, and your personal, I'm not here to defend <laughs> W5, your personal grievances are your personal no, grievances. No, but I would say that the... But, the, the, but the, to say that that doesn't serve a service to the Canadian I, public, well, I don't I think, think, it, I don't think it's I don't think it serves one that wouldn't exist in the in an open market. Yeah, Independent journalists from local but, areas. But, but there is no open market. But, That's but my local, point. Local news is... Local news, considering that, we'll just have it as a local, as a free market issue. The reality is it doesn't pay. Uh, and there is a public value in having access to it. No disrespect, but, uh, you know, streaming from Boca or blogging from my office is not news. It might get audiences, it might be able to sustain people, but it doesn't actually uh, That's allow That's the craziest people thing I've ever heard, Michael. I mean, streaming decisions. from Ottawa, streaming from Ottawa, one dude with a, with a camera is local news that is value added, that gets supported by the locals who want to see it and others who want to see it. And I do I, think, I think and the, there's a space for that. Yeah, and I, enterta I like entertainment isn't the same as news. It's, uh, of course it's great to be able to, to get different voices out there. It's not the same. I would only, I would say that, so, being, so, and, and here's the reality. If you want to be able to hold government to account, you have to have people who are there to hold them to account in ways that journalists do engage in. And ways that are, that are well, I, I would, in I would only say that the, to have to, ha to, to, to purport to um, label the difference between entertainment and news is the type of thing that leads to someone trying to define hatred and criminalize it. I, I don't know what you think is entertainment versus what you think is news, but. Uh, entertainment can be news, and news can be entertainment. Of course it can. And, and the more accurate when it comes to news, it is what succeeds over time. But the other thing is, going back to what you said earlier, that you do identify problems. And then one of them you identified was revenge porn, which seems to me, I, I, I can see that's a problem. I would also argue that there already exist laws to deal with that, such that you don't need new ones. Bullying online, this is going to sound very mean. You don't have the right to go online and think you're not going to get bullied. And if you want kids to not get bullied online, have their parents watch what they're doing online. Laws to protect children from bullying, bullying online, is a doomed proposition that will only be used against politically disfavored speech, period. But they're going to throw the kids in there. Won't someone think of the kids? You don't have the right to go online and not get called names. 
period. And someone calls me a dirty Jew online, I don't want them prosecuted. I actually want them to have the right to do that because if you suppress their right to do that, through the protection of the children pretext, you make the problem exponentially worse, as we've seen with each and every piece of legislation that gets passed to protect classes of people. We don't have... The, the, the reality is what, what, if we're switching back to that, if what C63 is designed to try to do is to ensure that there is not amplification of that content and that in certain cases, such as revenge porn, there are requirements to remove it. There are not are, laws, so there are not laws that do that right now. So you can say that, yes, you can seek justice in the criminal justice system in some of these instances. That is a long, difficult process that may or may not result in something, but does not address the immediacy of the harm that takes place and it does not address the amplification that may arise as part of that harm that can occur on some of these platforms. So why is it unreasonable to say that if you have platforms that have some amount of responsibility, that they are the ones playing this role, that we're going to hold them to account? And that's simply what that's trying to do. And I'm going, and, and, and respectfully, of course, there, there, it, it is a difficult line drawing process when we are talking about hate and bullying. But if one takes a look at what is taking place online right now, frankly, you don't have to go online. You can go into our streets to see months of hatred taking place, much of it incited online. And the notion of saying we want to try to find ways to, to limit the amount of amplification at a minimum of that hold platforms responsible where they, where they amplify it and have greater transparency about what's taking place, then I'm all for that. The, pro the problem is, yeah, you, you want to, I don't know, stop amplification, stop people from saying hateful things in the streets. Uh, if it turns out that everything you're doing, and not you as a person, but the government is doing, as a, as a remedy, is actually exacerbating the problem, do you stop and say maybe more laws are not the solution? When you look at the ADL in the States, Everything that they've done to purportedly curb anti-Semitism has exponentially exacerbated it to the point where even I blame them. It's almost like they're out there deliberately to exacerbate a problem so they can then propose solutions, all of which involve suppressing free speech. Now, here's the thing. My, my, my speech my speech, and my community speech has been suppressed for the last six months. Students on my campus, as a professor, I can't walk around, or if I do walk around with a Star of David, or if I put keep us welcome here on my office door, yep. uh, I run real risks. We can't do that. We have to, we have to try, we oftentimes remain silent. When it was back even in October, when it was Halloween, we debated, do we take the mezuzah off our door for fears of facing things? And so I'm sorry, this is very real right now. And, uh, and that amplification unquestionably plays a role to, to suggest that, you know, anti we're just making anti-Semitism worse by trying to deal with the anti-Semites. Uh, <laughs> strikes me as, as, as as, as just Michael, ignore, it just doesn't make any sense to but here, Here's a problem, uh, and a realistic one, where you go to Bill C-63, promoting, advocating genocide, potential life in prison. Yeah. Some people are going to say, keep us welcome here is genocidal talk. Some people are going to say that misgendering people is genocidal talk. They already say it. Yeah. And so then, you, you, you are, and I'm telling you, the, the, have you noticed the problems getting worse or better with each passing year of the Trudeau government and each passing legislation? It just gets worse. I'm, 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 saying, this, I'm saying this as a member of the community. Like, I, I say, I, I never say as a Jew. I'm just noticing it gets worse. And I'm saying what you're doing is making it worse because you are protecting classes of people, breaking society down into groups of people that are individual classes that somehow get more protections than regular people. And it just makes it exponentially worse, but the opaqueness of the law is going to come back to bite in the butt the people who think it's protecting them. To that end, there, there's a lot of concerns over censorship, reasonable concerns, people having their voices censored one way or another. Is there something that particularly we should be watching for the devil in the details, something a little bit deeper, whether it's the enforcement mechanisms, the digital safety commissioner that they have planned in C63, is there something that the public has reasonable skepticism around, around that regulation or enforcement mechanism, other devil's details to come, just trust us, the type of defense that they've right. offered before. Okay, so, so I do, as, as part of the internet piece, I've obviously made it clear that I feel that it's appropriate to hold the platforms accountable, uh, but who is holding them accountable is this digital safety commission, and I think that is poorly fleshed out in the legislation, and I think trust in this legislation will really ride and fall on the enforcers. And in this instance, I think the legislation needs to do a better job on that. On the criminal code side of the provisions, um, I think the inclusion of life in prison 
for the potential for up to life in prison, uh, where there's a motivation of, of hatred as part of any crime, uh, is just, it's an indefensible p pr uh, provision that just doesn't make any sense. The idea that, you know, if I got into a barroom fight and charged with assault and utter something hateful as part of that, suddenly it, the prospect of life in prison attaches to that is just nonsensical. And there are other kinds of implications that criminal lawyers will have a better sense of. It. I have a podcast that's been drilling down on this and spoke to the president of the Criminal Lawyers Association for next week's episode, and he was pointing out that once you attach life in prison as a potential sentence, you lose certain abilities. You lose the potential for a discharge. You have to uh, follow through on the basis of an indictment rather than a summary conviction. And so putting that in, and you don't necessarily have, and you don't have AG oversight over this, attorney general oversight. So uh, I think there are a lot of concerns uh, on those provisions. The, we, if, you, if you're looking for more fireworks, we could talk about the peace bond um, provisions, which I frankly think are more defensible than our uh, the life in prison one, although I understand why some would have concerns with them. And so the idea behind peace bonds is, is a prior restraint. If you know, for example, someone has a history of, of targeting synagogues, you want to try to find a way to stop them from attacking synagogues. Uh, and so peace bonds would be designed to do that. Uh, but there are people, certainly some people have expressed concerns about the inclusion of these kinds of provisions because there's clearly a speech element as part of the peace bond. Jen, do you have confidence yeah. in me? I said, the problem with C, as far as I know, C63 is that there are a couple of really interesting and even potentially useful elements within that bill. And I would say, potentially, maybe, having a digital safety commission, if, okay, say, say I, I, I have a partner who takes intimate pictures of me and wants to release it as clear revenge porn. I don't think that's protected speech. I don't think revenge porn classifies as protected speech. I don't think child porn classifies as protected speech. And having some kind of mechanism where I can go to a digital safety commission and say, my partner's spreading, uh, spreading revenge porn against me, uh, somebody's spreading child porn, blah, 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 blah. Is there a mechanism for me to rapidly remove that kind of thing from the, from the internet? Potentially, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. I don't think it's a bad idea to require um, uh, platforms to be more transparent about their algorithms, for example. I don't think it's a bad idea to require platforms to maybe put some safeguards in terms of how they're designing their platforms to limit harms. For example, if you're under the age of 16, maybe you can't send pictures of yourself in, in private messaging. That would be a, an example of smart design in a clever way. And that kind of stuff is in the bill. The devil's in the details. And I think that this government has a very bad habit of writing legislation very poorly and then expecting its poor, poorly um, drafted legislation to be resolved later on at the regulatory stage. The problem with the bill is that, yes, in addition to some of these potentially good ideas, you have a lot of crap folded in. And I would say the, the revivification of Section 13 in the human rights tribunals, obvious problem, no, no question, no debate. Um, that will have a chilling effect on speech, that will have a chilling effect on speech that, we, that I think we now regard as being within the Overton window of acceptable um, chat. I think that's an obvious issue. Um, the peace bonds, I mean, no one has an issue with peace bonds when there's an imminent threat of violence. I agree with you. When you're applying peace bonds to potential, to potential speech crimes, what the hell are we doing here? Like, that, that's, that's just, just wanna, I want to read the, def the definition of hate speech. In this section, hate speech means the content of communication that expresses detestation or vilification of an individual or group of individuals on the basis of a prohibited ground of discrimination. And it says, it, does, it, it doesn't count if it's only disdain or dislike or seeks to discredit, humiliate, hurts, offense. Yeah, I mean, this is ridiculous. You're preaching, this is and you're preaching to the Legislating morality. Yes, but back it up to the... Well, well, no, no, sorry, all just, just, just so that morality, people understand the context, that language is literally derived directly from the Supreme Court of Canada. Yeah. It's not the government making this up. This sure. is directly how the Supreme Court of Canada has interpreted hatred. There, but there's also a reason why Canada has been the laughing stock of the international community for trying to regulate and prohibit thought crimes and morality. I mean, it, it's not... It's, it's, legislation can remedy the problems instead of ratifying the problems. Now, when it comes to child pornography, already illegal, already every mechanism under the law to deal with that. Sure, but when there, it comes isn't to revenge a, there, isn't, porn, there isn't a mechanism under the law to have it rapidly uh, removed from the go internet. To, go get, an, get clear, a, a get so an injunction that's, that's, or go get, a, t get a TRO. Yeah, I mean, am, am I wrong in thinking that there's not already remedies to deal with child pornography yeah, online? You're, you're dead wrong. The legislation literally includes a full section that ensures that social media companies are subject to the same reporting requirements around child pornography. That does not exist right now. I'm sorry, but we, we, the notion that somehow we figured everything out for the internet and it applies to these companies and we did it 20 or 30 years ago when they didn't exist 
is simply wrong. There, they, there, there were not rules for these companies in this context. And so one of, one of the pieces of legislation, part of this legislation actually says, if we're going to require the oligopolies to report where they've identified child pornography, surely we need to do the same thing when it comes to uh, social media companies. The law currently doesn't require and, that. And the other point I would just make is like, I agree with you in, in my libertarian cat phase. I absolutely agree that we should be living, working in a pure free market economy where the best media outlets win and, and, and the, the bad ones fall to the wayside. Great. The problem is we don't live in a free market economy. We live in a highly regulated oligopoly. So if you want to talk about a free market economy, let's talk about breaking up Bell, let's talk about breaking up Rogers, let's talk about breaking up all of these oligopolies so that actual free, actual media organizations can compete on the free market. But until we have that, until we don't, we don't have, that's not the reality we're facing. So like I said, do I think that C18 is in any way appropriate as, as, as a way to uh, address the, the zombie corporations that, are organized, that our media organizations have become? No, emphatic no, incorrect, eh. but... You know, un until you're actually ready to have a free market and, and, and accept the consequences of that free market, then, um, then the government has, has um, created a role for itself to play here. <laughs> That's all the government does, is create a role well, for I, itself. That it's, sure, it's the I ball. Agree. That's, That's the problem, well, and not if the you, solution. And like I said, if you, wanna, if, you, if you want to appease my libertarian cat instincts, I'm all for breaking no, no, it no, up. Let's, let's start, we can but, start with one. <laughs> Defund the CBC, period. That's $1.6 okay. billion. Dollars. I know that that's, no, I know that's going to be a really popular thing in this room. My argument isn't a defund, my mm. argument is a radical mandate review, because I do think that, this, that, that there is a role for, for the CBC to play, but I would like to see the CBC see itself more as a library or a store of information and training, and also a place for archives for, for history. This, this is the same archives. argument, though, instead of like disband the FBI, disband the CIA, it's reform, re overhaul. At Correct, some point, they yes. become so fundamentally rotten and corrupt, they cannot be overhauled. Start from scratch, at least on one thing. Okay, we could, I love, probably, look, look, we could probably spend an hour on the CBC. <laughs> oh, you by the we'll a, hey, hit me up at the hospitality suite if you're interested in a conservative-ish, contra, controversial take in this room about what we should be doing on the CBC, because I think the problem with the CBC is if you defund it, you're going to have to replace it with something else. And you will. Does and you it, will. Does and you think that now. You think we, that we now, discuss this. We put a pit in that and debate Jen in the hospitality suite. It's there a you good, go. It's a good right. topic. I'll be, I'll be drunk and belligerent. It'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's zoom out just a little bit. I just want to take this to an era that's, that's close, but it, it, beyond the, you know, what we're doing here in our country, how does this compare to what is happening in other countries? I know we talk a lot about kind of Canada's becoming a dystopian state in different areas. How does that reflect sort of us comparative to the U.S., compared to Europe, compared to other places uh, around the globe in terms of this particular type of online regulation or censorship? Do, Dr. Geist, do you want to weigh in on that? I can start. I guess it depends a little bit which bill we're talking about. If we're talking about, C if we're, stay if we're staying sure. on C63. C63 for the sake of argument. Sure. So if we, st if we stay there, though we can get to C18 as well, of course. If we stay on C63, you know, I think some of the kinds of provisions that we find, especially within the online harms piece, are pretty consistent with what we're seeing in other places. The UK is move, similarly moving towards a duty to act responsibly. Um, frankly, in the US, we're seeing a greater push on liability coming out of California and elsewhere for uh, social media companies. I, one of the reasons we haven't seen uh, a significant amount of opposition from social media companies, at least so far with this legislation, is that the, the approach by and large is not wildly out, inconsistent with either where some other countries are or where it appears things are moving. And so part of the issue, I think, with some of the other kinds of legislation that we had, let's say trying to regulate user content uh, as part of C11, um, was out of step. You know, the Europeans have rules, but they don't, address, they don't include user content in that way. And I think once you become a real outlier, that's where you increase regulatory costs, certainly for some of the streaming services, um, and it becomes much harder to justify because people often do ask that question. But on the harms piece, it's not wildly inconsistent. In fact, there are jurisdictions that frankly go much further um, in terms of some of the kind of speech that they regulate. The, U the UK, for example, goes further than this legislation yeah, does. They, and and they jail somebody for making a meme joke with their pug doing the, the Hell Hitler salute and put him in jail. I mean, the fact that there's other countries that are worse is the problem. It's an indication of where we're going, not an indication of where we should be going. Brazil's getting worse. At least we're not Brazil yet. I mean, the, the problem is, it's sort of like the Jordan Peterson thing. We're like, nudge, 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 back up. Nudge, 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 back up. And then in 15 years from now, you can't say F Trudeau on Twitter without going to jail. 
I mean, the, the fact that there's other countries out there that are worse is an indication of where things are going. It, to be clear, I, mean, I, wasn't, well, I wasn't using that as a case to justify yeah, yeah, what we're doing. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was simply trying to answer the question yeah. uh, in terms of, of, of that comparative look. And, of course, I, I think this notion that we have to do what others are doing is a mistake, uh, and I, I think a wrong approach. I do think, though, that the amount that competition in this space, choice to ensure that, let's say, in the streaming side, we get as, as many different services as possible that serve different kinds of communities. I think you have to account for the regulatory costs that you bring into this, otherwise you may lose some of those. And the same would be true for C18. In the case of C63, I think different countries are going to make different judgment calls about the, the kind of safety that they expect. But, you know, fr quite frankly, I think the platforms themselves have increasingly recognized, there are exceptions of course, but many of the large platforms have themselves taken on board the concerns that have been raised around kids, around amplification of different harms. They're facing not just legislation, but they're facing class action lawsuits now brought by large numbers of school boards. We've got it in Canada. It's happening across the United States as well. And that is going to incentivize change within those platforms as well. I don't, you know, this notion that if the government just stays away and not, none of this kind of regulation is going to happen, I've got news for you the platforms themselves are increasingly going to move towards an increased level of um, regulating themselves, not just because they're required to do so by government, but because there is, I think, a growing uh, recognition and acknowledgement that there are problems on those platforms that need to be addressed. And simply saying that we'll just let it all go and we'll, you know, let, let, we'll just, we'll let it all go and whatever happens, happens. Um, I don't think reflects where society by and large is at, and I don't think it reflects where the platforms are at either. Just to make sure I wasn't attacking Michael before, I was just saying that is the, that is the justification, or the, that is the thought process of many say, well, let's compare ourselves to Brazil, let's compare ourselves to the UK, and let's judge uh, North Korea and Russia because they've gone too far. But you know, it's a bit of a straw man. Nobody's saying no regulation whatsoever. I, I would say litigation over legislation is a, better, is a better solution to problems. When people suffer the consequences with their dollar, they'll make the changes on their own without the government coming in, le le legislating for its own benefit. When it you comes speak to, to that part, the monetization piece, the kind of how this is sort of fueling this for, for the users themselves. How is that? How is the monetization for the platforms and what they're being subject to with these regulations? How is that kind of affecting the trend and what you're seeing? I don't, I, I don't notice any, any effect there except for on YouTube, which you know, uh, applies their rules willy-nilly with political bias like it's nobody's business. So they'll demonetize someone who reports on Epstein if it's a disfavored or you know, a, a small media, but then the legacy media get to make all the money they want off of it. It's a way of propping up the legacy media. Yeah. But, you Wait, know, sorry, your argument is that the way that YouTube is uh, engaged in its... In its in well, I'm its just saying that YouTube applies their rules, which are, you know... For to the benefit the legacy media? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you'll, you'll notice every, every, every link after... How is the legacy media... I mean, the leg, uh, like Fox News, you, CNN, NBC, uh, CNN, YouTube MSNBC. YouTube is eating legacy media's lunch. They're their direct competitor. Well, they're, they are direct linking. When you go from a Rebel News video, it'll link you right to Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, videos after that. That's how they do it. They allow that's, them that's to monetize... The algorithm. Whatever it is, that's what happens. So they, they allow them to monetize content that independent creators can't monetize. But bottom line, I'll just say C63, C11, C18. I don't view these as you know, individual separate legislation. This is an attempt to govern the last wild west of exchange of ideas, the internet. It's intended to empower the government. It's intended to prop up the legacy media through indirect subsidies that they can no longer get directly because they've maxed out subsidizing the CBC and Radio Canada. They've maxed out bailing out print media. They've maxed out COVID ads for legacy media. And now they've got to go with the link tax. They've got to go with C63 to shut people up and apply these. Well, they're not going to be applied fairly, period. And they're going to be applied for the political benefit of the political party in power which is why I don't necessarily trust the conservatives to, wheel, to pull these levers when they come into power, because everybody supports free speech until people use it to attack their power. Well, that's, that's another great point. So, speaking on the future of this, do you think a potential future government just undoes it all, starts from scratch? Where do you think they go from there? Dave, uh, sorry. You Dr. Guys. You know what I'm saying? Um, well, I think the... On C11 and C18, I think the, the government, the Polyev has spoken of, of repealing. I must admit, I'm not sure what that means in the context of C11. I can, I can hypothesize. I don't think it means... C11 is really reformed to the Broadcasting Act, which hadn't been reformed in 30 years. I don't think he's going to repeal the Broadcasting Act. Um, but I think, that, I think that there is the prospect of making clear what is now in a policy direction, and that is that user content is taken off the table, uh, which is frankly what the government should have done in the first place, and allows um, 
would, would allow a future government to say, okay, we've ensured that the user side is not caught by this kind of regulation and it's now embedded within the legislation as it should have been in the first place. In the case of C-18, I was having this exact conversation with someone recently, uh, just yesterday rather, and I mean, it's, it's an interesting discussion. In, in theory, there's an easy win. Um, you repeal C-18 and news links return to Meta. Um, the question, of course, then becomes, does Google walk away from the $100 million deal that they've got? And um, they're going to, by that point, so. there are going to be many entities that, that will say, listen, we've, we've benefited from that. And uh, if, this is, if the legislation, if you're trading the return of links for taking $100 million out of the system, that's a deal that we're not so happy about. So I think, it, I think it's going to represent a really significant challenge. And as for C63, I mean, the bill is, was introduced a month ago. It hasn't gone to committee yet. Um, I don't know what they're going to do because I don't even know what, whether or not this bill is going to pass or what it's going to look like if it does. Do you have anything you would save from C11, C1863, Jen? I don't feel like I'm particularly well qualified to speak to C11, um, but I, in terms of C18, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think C18 needs to be repealed in full. I don't think that there's a value add there, um, and I think that it distorts the market Preserve, very min, helps to very minimally preserve organizations that aren't financially viable on their own, and I think it creates uncertainty in the entire marketplace that 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 sucks money out of the the private money I'm talking about out of the industry and makes it harder to innovate and compete. So yeah, I think C18 just needs to be repealed. I think that's an easy easy conversation. Uh, C63, I think you're right. It's a question of how, what actually is passed, if anything, before the next election. I think there's a pretty good chance that this that this dies on the vine, essentially, which would not be a bad outcome. I do think you are going to have the Conservatives come forward with something like an online harms act. It won't look like this. It would look like something else, and I think we'd be debating about that. that the problem, the dying on the vine and no harm, no foul is a bit of the oh, issue. Oh, I didn't because, say no harm, no foul. Okay, I just said, the, the Overton window has now been no. shifted to like when we come back to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying dying on the vine is, it, this is, this is a harmless conversation. I've spent 3,000 words pointing out in, in great detail all the issues that I have with C63 and why I think it's a big baddie. I just think that that's the realistic outcome here. Do you keep anything, David? Uh, well, the C11, I mean, again, I'm also not an expert, so I, I say, as far as I understand, the C11, I, again, wh what problem was it resolving? You want to get some money uh, from streaming platforms, Hulu's, Netflix, yes, individual content creators where they overtly misled about it, then included an amendment that they struck in the dead of night and then said, we're not going to cover individual user accounts. Okay, we will if you're acting like a broadcast, or uh, acting like a, uh, I think they said broadcaster. Um, I I exclusion of independent accounts would be one solution. Exclusion of people who don't take uh, government subsidies should not be subject to certain government controls would be another solution. Uh, C18, I don't understand what problem it was trying to resolve in the first place. My understanding of it, I think I asked you this publicly, I thought C18 was penalizing, basically appropriating the news without linking to the source itself, whereas if you're linking to the source itself, you're, Google's not only not penalizing them, it's benefiting them by driving traffic yeah, there. Think, and they're going to make them pay $100 to, million dollars to, a year for the benefit? Yeah, I mean, to, to understand C18, I think you have to understand the mindset of a lot of what I would say old school mainstream media executives, and this is, this is a mindset that I've been subject to by virtue of my career for a really long time, they had this idea that, that Google was stealing from them, that Google was stealing from them as a result of the aggregators. And they, like, so they, but they got this into their head, like we're spending all this money on all of our journalism, and here these, these platforms can just take our content and then make money on advertising that we otherwise would be able to make yeah, money and on. And so they formed a lobby about this, and that lobby is, was able to bend the ear of government into creating C18, which was meant to be a copy of what Australia's bill, which they saw as, as being a huge success. It was fundamentally flawed. It, as like I say, when I said at the beginning, it was a fundamentally flawed in execution, and I think it was philosophically flawed. And it fundament mm -hmm. also one of the, I think the real issues with C18 <laughs> is that the government didn't understand why mainstream media was failing economically, and so therefore bought into the mainstream media executives' logic and thinking and reasoning and how to preserve and resolve it. They see it. They saw it as a way of equalizing a market market inequality as opposed to seeing what what it actually was, and that was forcing the um, Google and, and platforms who were, monet who were more able to effectively um, monetize their platforms than the traditional mainstream media were. Um, how, like I said, that gets into the conversation about why media is failing, and it's oftentimes not why people think it's failing. Um, mainstream media actually has more eyeballs than it ever has at any point in its history. Uh, the reason why it's failing is because it can no longer command the advertising monopoly that it once did. With the advent of uh, Facebook and Google, its advertising monopoly collapsed. 
um, and it was unable to compete with those organizations for, a high, for basically highly effective advertising money. So That's the, why it's failing. On the economic front, then, it's fair to say the government's entries into this foray have not necessarily helped the economic model of the mainstream media. They haven't oh, really they, been they, able they, to they've, succeed they've, any further. They've strung along zombie corporations for a little bit longer. The problem is that it hasn't fixed the sustainability, the long-term sustainability problems. And a huge part of the media also as well is that they were supporting, legacy media has traditionally supported lots, large amounts of debt. I mean, we know that a lot of um, the profits that a lot of these corporations are making, particularly post-media, are going to hedge fund organizations that have sort of sliced and diced these, these, these uh, corporations a million times over and are keeping them barely alive at usurious rates. So they're zombie corps, right? Um, so, yeah, providing a subsidy, and most of these subsidies are tied to journalists, so uh, actual bodies in, 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 the, in the newsroom, right? So that's not necessarily, okay, good, I guess we want journalists. The problem is that the second these subsidies go away, all of these organizations, to my mind, become financially unsustainable. And to me, that's the, as an independent media creator, that's a terrible business decision. Like, you can't make yourself wholly, wholly dependent upon a government in power in order to keep your business model afloat. Like, that's, that's disastrous, particularly if you're in the media, because whether you like it or not, that means that your financial future is tied to a, a political outcome, even if you, you rigorously try to be as independent as possible. It damages your credibility, and it also is, as I said, it's just a terrible business model to be building a, a, an economic model. If I were to challenge one thing you said, I would challenge the idea that MSM has more eyeballs on it now than ever. I mean, uh, my understanding is Yeah, I mean, is I'm happy to provide you the data on that if you I want. Will, I will look at that Absolutely. with a, with a please, uh, please skeptical do. eye. Yep. Um, because my, you know, my, my view is all they would have to do is compete honestly on the same platforms that independent if, media if, is if, succeeding on. If you on. want me to break down the economic mistakes and issues that, that mainstream <clears throat> media has made and why they've gotten to this point, I'm happy to do so. But it's a combination of, of, of debt, it's a combination of collapse of advertising monopolies, and it's a combination of the fact that they're sustaining these, or they're, they're trying to support extremely expensive debt and very expensive uh, body-heavy organizations on a fraction of the digital rav revenue that they're able to, sorry, a fraction of the digital rad ad revenue that, that they were able to generate compared to the print ad revenue that they once created. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, comp it's a perfect storm of factors that is just trouncing these organizations, but it's not lack of eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, I just, I, and I would align myself with just about everything Jen just said. I, I guess you, you started by asking, you know, what next kind of thing and the response, uh, and the focus was on repealing. But, but I suppose there's a couple of other things that are, I think are worth thinking about as we think ahead. One is that the, the measures that the government's taken around support for the sector are not limited just to C18, oh, right? God, so, no. so this no, no, link no. Is, is just part of it. Yeah. There, are wide, there are very significant tax credit systems, the labor journalism tax credit and the like. Uh, what you do about that as it spreads uh, to provinces as well, in, in the province of Quebec, certain media outlets are almost 100% covered, their newsrooms are almost 100% covered uh, by the combination of tax credits and other kinds of supports. And so it raises the question, how can you truly be independent when you have yeah. that sort of support? But the, I would say a future government will face this same issue in a slightly new wine, a slight, in a slightly old bottle, and that will be AI. And okay. we will get the same questions around using this content for the purposes of creating large language models to create these AI systems, and should there be funding? And you know, certainly the new sector will argue we need to be paid for this in the same way that we, well, we'd like to be paid for other sorts of content. And it will, and you know, perhaps that will get sorted out through litigation or through agreement. But if it doesn't, uh, then a future government will face the same question. And it's uh, that broader question around AI regulation, but a portion of it involves these copyright questions. And I would say also AI is going to absolutely be transformative, especially for local, local yeah. news in places like Canada, mm -hmm. because it would potentially allow a local news organization to say, say I'm running a, a one-person operation in Medicine Hat, right? Well, now instead of needing three or four reporters to cover what's going on in Medicine Hat, maybe I'm one editor and I can use AI to summarize the latest um, council meeting or summarize the latest local sports scores, and one person can now potentially do the, do the work of 10 local reporters to provide a service to that community. 
that's going to be really revolutionary and whether or not that is, ro is rolled out in a way that is serving the public good and serving um, the local communities in a way that's positive or in a way that's um, highly manipulative or, or, or corrosive, is, I don't know what the answer to that question is going to be. No one knows what, where AI comes into this, this conversation. Well, so, so, so long as AI doesn't generate a, a black Thomas Jefferson because it's been programmed uh, yeah. to be woke. I mean, well, the, but, the, yeah, but this, who, is put, this is part well, of the problem, right? Like, the, this these is, are going to be, the, well, the, then you're going to see gonna what issues. happens when it's a government funded AI that's going to generate. New problems for a new I, generation. The I, I, the I don't, I don't line, think this oh, government so is forward-thinking to be funding AI, but <laughs> <laughs> no, to but be fair. I, I would, my, my bottom line takeaway from all of this is that the less government involvement in things of the utmost importance of media, mm -hmm. the better. You, you, you yeah. can't have government involvement and then have it be independent anymore. Yeah, okay. and, and I don't... I, I, You're it might be the fire on that one, man. I, I mean, and I don't trust the conservatives when they come into power to repeal the levers, the levers of power that they now have at their disposal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it is... Whether or not it's a, a number of reasons why the model is failing, at some point, what's that movie? Uh, it, was a, it was a Dr. Seuss, let it die, but you say, let yeah. it die, something new will come out of the ashes. Or independent, and they'll find a way to survive. The problem is, yeah, when right. you get handouts, you don't have the urge, the need to survive, thrive, yeah, it, and it, evolve. It, and in every, and so, in every industry where you have handouts or government dependency, you, you kill innovation. And, and, and that, is, that is what media in Canada is about. You, have, you go to the, the States, you'll have more independent, you still have the problems with the Fox News and the CNNs and talk about pandering to bases or whatever. But that's considered to be the, the, you know, the objective news when in fact the independent voices are succeeding, and I dare say, not because they're targeting their own echo chambers, but because they are being more responsible than we have discovered mainstream media has ever been. This problem has been I mean, maybe I, 100 years in the making. As since an independent the, media, I like, to th I like to think so. I like to think that our audience actually, read the line, that's it. I like to think that our audience chooses to pay for us because they find value in us. Yeah, and, and not if you because, make a mistake, and not you'll because, and, Yeah, and, and not because I necessarily need to be able to earn, at all, I, we, we, we refuse to take any government money and absolutely will, not only for philosophical reasons, but because bluntly, it's a terrible business decision. It's a terrible business model, right? Like if my, I want, a, I want, I want people who pay for, for my, my, my services and what I produce because they find value in it, right? That's my job and that's my role to align with that. However, I'm not um, uh, uh, immune to the fact that I run a two-person substack that's MacGyvered with some, with some, some, a back end um, uh, and some, and some duct tape as well, right? Um, I, Keep, I, keep overhead low. It's the, uh, overhead <laughs> the best low, way right? to do it. Well, it is how you keep overhead low. But I, but I, I am concerned when you took it a, 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 AI, local news, um, where the where the private sector is going on all of this. I, I do get concerned about how do we ensure that there are going to be people out there.